Well, good afternoon. It's always a pleasure to introduce seminar speakers, but it's a bigger pleasure when the seminar speaker is a really distinguished Leeds alum. So Magdi got her PhD in Leeds with Dimitri Bertsekas. That was uh, in 2003, although it feels as if it was just yesterday. But since then, Mengdi has been uh, with Princeton, initially Department of Operations Research Financial Engineering, now moving closer to electrical engineering, I understand, and she's also spending time in DeepMind. So Mengdi has done lots of wonderful work, but a big chunk of it is on reinforcement learning, trying to look at the, really the most fundamental and interesting problems in that space. And so I'm looking forward to hearing whatever new results you have. Thank you, John. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be back to where I got my PhD. And so I, I'm going to be mostly talking about theory in this talk because this is a late seminar. So I think it's supposed to be one of the most theory intensive seminar series on campus. OK, so I'm going to talk about statistical complexity of RL. So I, also, I'm going to assume that most of you are familiarized with the basic setting of RL. So I'm going to uh, do a very short introduction of RL. So basically, uh, RL is about learning to control, or learning to act in the environment. And there has been like uh, tons of impressive, incredible successes in RL. And as I was chatting with John, so if we try to think about the most impressive RL applications, the first application that comes to our mind is usually computer games. And if we try to think about a second application, maybe we'll think about maybe robotics. And we have to be aware that in a computer game and in some robotics applications, usually there the game, the environment, can be perfectly simulated, or even maybe not perfectly simulated for robotics, but nicely simulated. And once we have a perfect simulator of the environment, then RL often boils down to how to computationally find a near optimal policy. So, but we do need statistics here. We do need statistics to understand what happens if data is limited. We do not have a perfect simulator of the world, and we have to try to learn from limited resources. OK. So the first very basic question that we try to study is, let's say that I want to approximately estimate a near optimal policy, maybe an absolute optimal policy. How many samples are sufficient and necessary? So let's work with uh, the very basic setting. Suppose that we have a gentry model. And gentry model is actually a perfect simulator. So it's the nice, we're in a nice world when we have a gentry model, meaning that we actually have a simulator of the environment. And we as the agent, or we as the user, we can specify a state action pair. And the gentry model is going to run one time step and provide a sample of reward or a sample of state transitions. So this is uh, one very basic setting. OK. So what's our model? So let's look at, again, we start with the simplest model for reinforcement learning, a Markov decision process, a finite state, finite action Markov decision process. So I'm sure you have seen this plot. I, I borrowed it from Google. And it must be used in many talks on RL. OK, so let's say that we have a finite set of states, big S. We have a finite set of actions. And we have a reward function that depends on state and actions. We also have a set of transition probabilities from state action to state. OK, so if the reward and transition models are explicitly known, this, is, this reduces to a dynamic programming problem, which we can just solve it. OK, and the optimization formula is right here. We want to maximize over all policies to find the highest long-term reward, which is called the value function. So sometimes this is called tabular MDP. So by tabular, we mean that we can represent the model 
using a table. And we do not have any structural assumption on the geometry of state space. So I cannot infer knowledges about another state from a given state. They are just not related. OK, so this is the non-structure setting. And it turns out that even in this very simple case, and with a perfect general model, the sample complexity of RL was not a trivial question. So if we try to look into early literatures on RL and try to look at earlier algorithms that try to approximately compute optimal policies and optimal Q functions using a general model, and uh, you can see that there are actually there's uh, a line of uh, different results achieved by variants of RL algorithms. Okay, so if we compare this one with this one, okay, you might say that okay, so it's really just some polynomial dependence on some parameter of the process. Why do we care? So gamma here is the discount factor. So if we think about this one over one minus gamma, it can be really viewed as an effective horizon of the process. So if we take gamma to be 0.99, basically we mean that we care about planning for the next 100 time steps, roughly speaking. So by picking such a gamma, which is very typical in any deep RL algorithm, then if we compare this sum of complexity and that sum of complexity, the speed up is 10 to the 8 times. So that's actually huge. It's really just the dependence on one factor, and it's huge. OK. So this is a slide I copied from my co-author on the paper. So you don't have to really try to read it. I just want to tell you that even getting the mean max sample complexity in this super basic setting is not trivial. And one actually needs to apply a number of tricks, like approximate value equation, variance reduction, something to preserve monotonicity with high probability, and also a particular way to do low total variance analysis. And putting all the techniques together, one can achieve the best sample complexity upper bound. So at least for this very basic problem, uh, we're, we're happy to announce that the statistical sample complexity is, is soft. Again, we are working with the Janju model. And there is a, a paper by a bunch of folks at DeepMind a few years ago. They proved that there is an information theoretical limit. So any algorithm that interacts with a genuine model cannot find a good absolute optimal, pro uh, absolute optimal policy with reasonable probability using sample size less than this one. <coughs> okay. And uh, by putting together a bunch of techniques, we finally figure out one way. And then there turns out to be other ways. There's, there are ways to achieve the lower bound in terms of sum of complexity. So at the very least, we know the, the right answer for this basic problem. OK. So and apparently, we, are not, we shouldn't be happy about this result. This is really just a, a very basic result for discrete problems. It doesn't tell us anything about how to solve a practical large scale problem. OK. So the problem is S, our state space, is just too big to be discretized. So suppose that my state variables are d-dimensional variables, d-dimensional vectors. And say that we do not have any structural assumption on the state space other than continuity. <coughs> and then we can think about, okay, let's just do a plain vanilla discretization of the state space. And then we get exponentially many states. And now if we think about the size of the policy space, that is going to be exponential in the number of states in the number of actions. And even if we take the logarithm of the size of the policy space, that is still going to be exponential after taking log. So basically, the short answer is uh, having the sharp sum of complexity for the discrete state problems is far from enough. S is too big, and we cannot do simple uh, discretization. OK. Sorry, what you showed here is the number of policies, and then you're Conclusion is about sample size, so you just want to say you need sample size at least number of policies, or? Oh, I just want to say that one as I speak, all the quantities are super large. So the minimax sample complexity is not super meaningful. 
And here I'm saying, I'm, I'm, I mentioned the log of policy space because there are some results in which some complexity depends on this logarithm. But that logarithm is actually a huge number. Okay, yeah. Okay, so let's add a little bit of structure. So actually this uh, came from a very early research generated from MIT Lit. So what if we have a state feature map? Meaning that for every raw state, my raw state could be just this image. We have a number of feature functions that tells me about important characteristics of the current state. So one example is um, Tetris, which is the first ever game solved by RL. Um, John can correct me if my statement is wrong. It was That's a backgammon. Back <laughs> I should mention backgammon. Okay, so it turns out that, you, that Tetris can be solved pretty well using tw only 22 hand-picked features. And the features are intuitive, like uh, the height here, and also the number of holes on the top level, and maybe the number of holes on the second level. So just intuitive features to be picked by humans. And um, nowadays, one can pick features by, for example, using the state embedding learned by neural networks. Or one can consider that, we can even consider lift the dimension of the raw state space by doing some random feature expan uh, expansion. And then we can use compression methods to find a lower dimensional representation of the space space to maximally preserve some important quantities or some notion of predictivity. So basically, uh, as long as there is a good state feature map, sometimes we can do much more. Okay. So for now, I'm going to assume that we are <coughs> given such a state feature map. How to learn this is an independent subject. Okay. And again, so to those who are not familiar with the use of state features, so one very basic way to use state features is let's parameterize the value function, which is a high dimensional function that maps all states, that maps states to a single value. Okay. So what if we parameterize this value function using a linear weighted combination of feature values? So this basic idea turns out to be have, I mean, um, very commonly used in approximate dynamic programming algorithms. I mean, way before deep RL, when I was an undergrad and when we were we will learn how to program a solver for a simple chess game. We actually use this linear function approximation together with tree search. So one can get a reasonable algorithm, but definitely not I mean, far from uh, good enough. Okay, so basically the hidden assumption is we are trying to approximate a high dimensional value function within a low dimensional function class. And a very simple beta case is maybe the function class we consider is spanned by a number of features. Okay. So now I, I hope to convince you that such <coughs> value function approximation could be reasonable. Let's look at the Bellman equation, the optimatic condition for control and reinforcement learning. So here I'm writing down the infinite horizon average word Bellman equation, uh, just because it has a simpler, simpler uh, formula. Okay. So if you look at this Bellman equation, we are trying to find the best control for every state. So we have an optimization problem for every state. And then the dimensionality blows up because the total number of states is huge. And also, this max operator is nonlinear, which we do not like because we, we, we ideally want to work with something linear or smooth if you want to do functional approximation. Okay. So one way to rethink Bellman equation is this Bellman equation is equivalent to a linear program, which could be a very simple exercise if any one of you is taking linear program. Okay. And that linear program is equivalent to a minimax problem and a linear minimax problem. So what's nice is, so this equivalence can be proved 
very easily, as long as you have taken a video optimization course. But what's nice is now we have strong duality. And we have duality between value function and an ergodic distribution over the joint state action pair space. So that's a very interesting duality. And uh, writing the spelling equation into a minimax problem doesn't reduce its complexity. So this uh, problem still has complexity as a times s, as we just rewrite it. Okay. And by the way, like linear programming type methods have been investigated for approximate dynamic programming, like I mean, again, many years ago. I mean, around by people who were here way before DRL. Okay, so why is the linear programming formulation useful? Okay, so we begin with Bellman equation. As we explained, Bellman equation is high dimensional and nonlinear in nature. So it's, it's a bit uh, unpleasant. <coughs> but Bellman equation is equivalent to a minimax problem. We have strong duality and we have smoothness and the linearity is super nice. And now, if we think about this minimax problem, we can think about a restricted version of it when we have a given function class for value functions and for the corresponding invariant measures. Okay, so in a way that it is like that when we are doing supervised learning, we can consider supervised learning over a function class. Now we can consider reinforcement learning over a primal value function class and a dual stationary distribution function class. Okay, and uh, in the case, if my function class happens to be linear, we actually can reduce the Bellman equation into something which is pretty moderate dimensional. Okay, and also based on the linear algebra of this, so we can see that when we are trying to parameterize value functions and this dual stationary distribution, it's really like we are simply solving a high dimensional control problems by projecting the high dimensional quantities into a reasonable function class that we care about. Okay. Okay. So now that we have a simpler minimax problem, we can consider solving it. And uh, as an optimizer, I really like any problem formulation with duality. Okay, so we can just do something super simple. Whenever we have a state action state transition, okay, we learn something about the transition model. And the transition model is hidden in this <coughs> random function. So based on one simple sample, we can actually compute estimated partial gradients of the Lagrangian function. And then we can do value update and stationary distribution update in their low dimensional representations. Okay, it, does that make sense? It's really, um, it's really, uh, wait. So this is really a particular version of primal dual stochastic gradient descent ascent algorithm. And uh, this is the actual algorithm. And uh, you can see that in the actual algorithm, we are using exponentiated gradient ascent in the space of stationary distributions. And this actually can be viewed as a step that involves oh, the mirror ascent for updating the policies. And uh, we have also this value function update step. Okay, so basically uh, when we have linear models, everything can be implemented super easily. And one can really analyze this by using duality and primal convergence. Okay, so I call this primal dual policy gradient because the dual variable mu actually encodes a policy. Okay, so uh, suppose that the features we're working with are, are, are good. We are happy with the representations. So we can, we can show a few sample complexity results. So if the Markov decision process is infinite horizon without any discount factor, and we can show a sample complexity takes this form. And the key point is, now the sample de complexity depends linearly on the dimension of state feature space and dimension of action feature space. And also there is some dependence on the worst case mixing properties and the ergodic distributions of the Markov decision process. Okay. 
And this one, I do not know whether it's optimal. It's probably not optimal, but those quantities have to be there. The dependence could be improvable. Okay. So if we consider these concrete processes, because there's a natural, uh, I would say, contraction property of the process, actually one we can get a much uh, stronger result. So in this case, we can prove, again, the minimax optimal sample complexity and the still linear dependence on the dimension of state action feature space. Okay. So I think the short message is, uh, if we do have a good function class or a good features to present state and action spaces, then the RL sum of complexity should reduce from SA, which are huge, to dimension of A and the dimension of S, which are small. Okay. And this is not surprising at all if we look at the saddle point formulation. The complexity of this linear program really depends on the complexity of this primal space and the complexity of the dual space. And if we have nice restriction of the primal and dual spaces, we get better algorithms. So it's very intuitive. Okay, so uh, the next level question is, oftentimes we, do not, we cannot really assume that we have a perfect simulator. So what if we don't really have a simulator? We, ha we don't have a generative model, but we have past experiences, maybe generated by some other le learning agent or generated by some other experts. How can we use the batch data to predict the performance of a new policy? Okay. So this question is uh, this question is not very important in game AI when we have a perfect simulator, so we can just simulate everything nicely. But this question is going to be important in regimes when data and experiments are costly or even impossible. So for example, if we want to figure out a better clinical pathway for treating certain medical, pro medical, condition, medical problems, or for example, we want to learn to steer cells from particular states to another state. We have to really do experiments to collect any data, okay? And also if we think about clinical trials, each data point could be just one human, right? So in those applications, collecting data is really hard and we have to do our best from existing data. So for the batch problem, a first order problem is called off policy policy evaluation. But off policy means that uh, there's no ongoing training process. We just have a batch data set. So this name is by convention. So let's suppose that we have a data set of state action state transitions. I'm going to denote it abstractly by this D, D for data. And my data set are sample transitions generated from uh, past observations or like sample paths obtained by some other agent. For example, in the, <coughs> in the medical treatment problem, we consider that we basically have a bunch of historical uh, records from past patients. So each patient has a collection of medical claims or medical records, and that is a sample path. And that sample path gives me a, no, I mean, a number of state transitions observations. Okay. Now our goal is very simple. We want to estimate the value of cumulative return of a new policy from the data we have. So what do we know here? We know the new target policy. I want to try a new treatment, whether it would work better or not. And we have a fixed initial distribution, that is also something we have, we, we know. But we do not know the transition model here. We do not know the behavior policies that generated the data. Okay. And we might not know the reward function. So this is really a first order question in batch data reinforcement learning. Because imagine that we can evaluate this value, we can evaluate this, very nicely for every single policy. If we already have that, then we can simply evaluate all the policies and pick the best, right? 
So if we can solve this problem, the remaining, the remaining problem will be trivialized. So um, this task is critical for applications that are data limited. Like, can we predict how to train a new, how to, what would a new trading strategy, how would that work, knowing that I have market impact, which is not known. And also if I have patient history, how can I predict the performance of a new treatment plan? And if we can do this, uh, we can also solve many downstream tasks. For example, I, I can safely evaluate a number of potentially good policies, and then we can pick, their, pick the best. And we can also say, okay, I should continue exploring and trying something which was not covered in the current data set. Okay. And now if we look at this, this is perfectly a supervised learning problem. We have given data, and there's only one value that we want to estimate. Okay. So uh, when I studied the literature, I realized that there's a, 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 a large collection of existing results based on a smart idea called important sampling. So the basic idea is the following. So suppose that I have data from some distribution generated by a behavior policy. Now I want to estimate the mean of reward on, according to another distribution. So something simple is, if I want to estimate the instant reward at a particular state, given my target policy, we can simply reweight all the rewards in our data set um, if, the, if the corresponding state is S. And then we reweight it by taking the, the ratio between the probability for choosing action A in the two, pol in the two uh, policies. <coughs> and one can also do this in a, in a chain-like way to evaluate multi-step multi -step reward function. So some variants of important sampling require actually estimating this density ratio, which is really the ratio between a long-term distribution generated by one policy and against the long-term distribution generated by another policy. And one has to estimate this ratio for every action. And also, to, in order to compute this weight, one needs to know the behavior policy, or at least one has to be able to estimate it nicely. Okay. And there have been a lot of uh, efforts to analyze and a lot of improvement in important sampling methods. But however, there's some obvious challenge. So we all know that estimating a density estimation is very hard. And uh, when we have a tabular MDP, meaning that I have a large number of discrete states. And this ratio, especially if this ratio gets multiplied throughout iterative uh, training, so the error bounds can be explosively huge. And also there's this notion of curse of horizon means that uh, because we are using something very rough to estimate a one step transition, and now if I want to estimate multi-time step transition, easily my algorithm is going to diverge. And also this kind of method is heavily um, restricted to tabular MDP, and there's little I mean, there's not much theory and solution beyond the tabular case. Okay. So um, I want to propose something that's uh, entirely different and uh, I actually consider simpler. Okay, so, and also let's, let's add functional approximation to help with generalizability. Okay. Let's, let's denote this p pi as the transition operator under the target policy. We do not know this transition operator. But we're going to uh, suppose that we begin uh, with a function class. And my assumption is the reward function belongs to the function class. If we want to do any supervised learning, we have to be working within the function class. Okay. And also, I'm going to assume that the transition operator is closed in this function class. So if my function class is sufficiently expressive to express the reward function and the one-step transition, then all the Q functions we care about belong to this function class. Okay. So let's see what happens. So now let's do policy evaluation. 
and we do cost evaluation by dynamic regression. Okay. So we start with the last the terminal Q function and we set it as zero. And then we're going to be iteratively estimate the earlier Q function by simply doing regression onto the function class that we begin with. And this regression is taking uh, these square, uh, square laws over the entire training data set. Okay? So this is the simplest method I can imagine if I, we have a supervised learning task. Okay, and then we have the initial Q function and then we just compute the estimated value. Okay, so, and this is uh, also known as fitted Q equation, which this notion was proposed in other contexts of reinforcement learning. Okay, so let's see if regression works. So by the way, so it's worth noting that regression is Regression is just really so simple. The regression-based policy evaluator is equivalent to just a plug-in estimator. So by plug-in estimator is, we can <coughs> define an empirical transition operator by regression. And this empirical transition operator actually converges to, I would say, a projection of the ground truth transition operator onto the function class. And one can also define the empirical reward function. So if we have empirical transition model and empirical reward, we can simply solve the empirical approximation to the MDP. Does that make sense? So we have an empirical problem that we solve. So that's why it's a plug-in estimator. Okay. And it's actually pretty easy to see that the plug-in estimator is equivalent to the regression-based fitted Q equation. And um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, so this is really the empirical transition kernel in the case when my function class is a linear model. So, Maybe question. phi is the, uh, the target the policy used in the data, or it's the off policy? Pi is the target policy that we want to evaluate. We do not know the behavior policy used in the data. Okay. So this pi is what we know. Okay. So basically, since this is a plug-in estimate, as long as we have some way to estimate the transition model, we can just compute the policy or the, the value of the policy using any MDP algorithm, right? Okay, so now the next question is, okay, can we say something theoretical about this? So we try to analyze the plug-in estimator. And it turns out that the plug-in estimator is minimax optimal uh, or close to minimax optimal uh, in most cases. Okay. So I'm writing the theorem in an informal way. So basically I'm, I'm saying that if we think, uh, if we take infimum over all, pol all possible policy evaluator, okay, we take always take the best estimator and uh, we consider a supreme over all instances. Okay. And basically, <coughs> the policy evaluation error is uh, with the best estimator. It's always on this order. And the simple plugging estimator achieves this error lower bound. Okay. So let me try to explain what it is. So I have some chi q square here. Okay. So this chi q square is an important quantity. You, we can uh, imagine it as uh, a generalized notion of chi square divergence between two distributions. And here mu chi is the weighted state action algorithm measure under the target policy. And mu bar is the corresponding distribution of the data. So really, the statistical limit of our policy evaluation is quantified by some divergence between the two distributions. And since we're using a function class, we can imagine that if my function class is something super simple, then there's not, not there, there are, 
there, there are not many degrees of freedom, and the problem is simple. This also shows up here. So this divergence is defined in a variational form by taking supremum over functions in this function class. So to give you some a more intuitive example, in the tabular case, the, few, the Q function class is just the entire space of all possible functions defined on C action pairs. In this case, this divergence is the typical Pearson chi-square divergence. And if we happen to have a linear model, and then this chi-square divergence can be bounded by a mismatch between the covariance matrices <coughs> corresponding to the two different distributions. So we can think about it, so if we think about it, so if we think about covariance matrix, it's something whose dimensionality is much lower than the full density function. So then it's about mismatch in a lower dimensional representation rather than the mismatch between two entire density functions. Okay. So this may be a notational question. So when you say n greater than b h d is to I presume three point five. Yeah, three point five. Thank you. Right. Uh, so b was the dimension of the Oh yeah, thank you. So uh, D is the dimension of the Q function class. And the, the way I should think of function classes, uh, it's some kind of, uh, let's say, M2 or something like that, like it's some completeness? Uh, let's consider it's, uh, I, let's, I think the simplest setting is we just have a linear model or our, uh, our RKHS. Okay. And, and H is the horizon. H is a horizon, or it could be one over one minus gamma. And N was the number of uh, samples of the horizon. Total number of observations. Of state action maps. Yes. And so one way I should think of this, this is what is happening somehow uh, in sort of the important sampling-like uh, coefficient is showing up, but through regression-like uh, algorithm. Right. I think in, in some variants of important sampling, some quantities like this would also pop up, but in the tabular case, and that quantity is usually something too big to be useful. Okay. So I have a question also. So your in soup is the upper and lower bound. Uh, is it true for every class Q, or like the lower bound, there exists a class Q for which the lower bound holds, or it's true for any class Q? Uh, okay, good question. So, okay, so first, this is an informal argument. <laughs> This is a formal argument because the right-hand side sort of depends on the, the actual instance. So the formal argument should be an in soup of the probability of something which is greater than one minus theta. So that's informal. And also, so uh, the lower bound applies to linear Q function class. And also the lower bound, the lower bound we prove in the paper is really not soup over this full model. It's actually taking soup over a small neighborhood around any P. Uh, around any uh, instance. Okay, I think I missed one page of my slide. <laughs> okay, so I, I just wanna say a bit briefly. So really, I, I think it, there's a nice intuition there which is all about regression. So it turns out that regression works. So if regression cannot give me a reliable estimate. This mismatch chi-square thing <coughs> can be still s small if the two policies are similar. So if they happen to be visiting the same part of the state space. Okay. And also if regression is just not working, so it also means that the lower bound could be very large. And also we can characterize the sample size needed for this to hold. So it turns out that we do not really have to use a large sample size to get a reliable estimate. And this is in contrast with the curse of dimensionality that, was, that always happens in the tabular case. So what's really happening is there's an intrinsic contraction properties of the Markov process. And as long as the sample complexity is reasonable, that contraction is going to make sure that error accumulates linearly rather than blow up exponentially. Okay, I, I should have a slide about this, but somehow I, I deleted it. Okay. Okay, so assuming that we're happy with regression for the supervised learning problem. So next, let's consider, okay. 
what if the problem becomes harder? We, har we actually have to learn on the fly. Does regression still work? Okay, now we are in the regime of online exploration and online learning. So prior, the prior results I uh, presented, Adder assumes a general model, so we have perfect simulator. So basically the user can specify the simulator to begin at any state action pair. So there's guaranteed exploration by nature of the simulator. Okay. Or we assume batch data, so there's no exploration problem at all. So what if we have to learn, but we don't have a simulator? So the most basic setting here is called episodical reinforcement learning, meaning that we have a learning agent that is learning to control an age horizon problem. And it's going to learn by trying different strategies episode by episode. At the end of an episode, the agent can look back at all the history and try to come up with the next strategy to try. Okay. And the, by nature of this episodical <coughs> learning setting, um, the agent is not guaranteed to explore the full state space because the environment could be always lim could be limiting the agents to within only a particular subset of the state space. Okay, there's no automatic exploration as the general model case. Okay, and so this is basically an adaptive control problem. And uh, the regret of a learning agent is defined in a way very similar to regret in online bandit problems. So basically we're going to say that we have n episodes and t equals n times h, which is the total number of time steps. So we're going to look at the maximum reward we can earn in each episode and compare it with the actual <coughs> reward the agent earns. And we take the sum of this difference that is the regret of a learning agent. Okay. And notice that uh, the actual rewards earned by the agent is generated by a non-stationary policy because the agent changes his policy adaptively. Okay. So uh, I know many of you are experts in bandit theory. So we do know that the additional challenges of this setting is a single wrong decision could have a long-term effect. And also, there's more data dependency because we have our data are generated from uh, state transitions trajectories rather than, I would say, independent context. Okay. So again, the key problem is the trade-off between exploration and exploitation. Okay. And uh, actually, there are many pioneer works in this domain, which I, I don't have time to review in detail. Okay, so now let's again start with a simple case. So I assume that you are okay with my assumption that we have a good feature space so that we can parameterize the transition within a good linear function class. So to put it more precisely, I'm going to assume that we have a good state action feature map. So I can map every state action pair into a long vector. And also I have a state only feature map. So every state is mapped to another vector. Okay. So again, we're going to make this uh, assumption that the unknown transition operator can be embedded in the feature space that we already have. Okay. So more precisely, this is really a linear model. So basically we're saying that if I have the current state action feature, there's a linear model that I can use to predict the next state for important features of next state. Okay. And also we can imagine this phi and cosine are a, a, huge, a huge linear map. So we lift the space of state actions and the process is approximately li linear. Okay. So based on this, we can actually do online exploration in RL, again, by using regression. <coughs> okay, so the algorithm is pretty 
much similar to linear bandit. So the way to do this is suppose that I have we have a bunch of state transitions already. We are going to assimilate this core transition matrix, okay, which can be also viewed as a conditional mean embedding matrix. We assimilate this matrix by matrix regression. The regression is from state action features <coughs> to the next state feature. Okay. And then we can construct a, com a matrix confidence ball around our current estimate. Okay, this is a tolerance that is going to be picked in our room. Okay. So if my confidence ball is good enough, then we expect that with high probability, the confidence ball always includes the ground truth, the true model. And when we use the estimating model, we're going to do basically Q function update with optimism. So by optimism, I mean that whenever we try to use the model, we're going to pick the most optimistic model in the confidence form. So we are getting the most optimistic upper estimate of the Q function when we try to compute it. Okay. And now we have optimistic Q functions. We just use these Q functions to freely choose the next uh, policy to use in the new episode. Okay. So this is basically a special case of model-based reinforcement learning algorithm. And because we have this good feature state representation, then everything becomes just regression and matrix regression. Okay, so another way to view this is, so really when we do Q update, so doing Q update with a confidence set is equivalent to just doing empirical Q update with a bonus, with a bonus to encourage exploration. And uh, the Q update is based on regression using the latest update from the next stage. And the model estimation is actually hidden in this regression step. And this is an alternative view of this matrix area algorithm. Okay. And basically, by just doing this, we can reduce the t times back regret to something that depends polynomially on d. <coughs> okay. Um, Another thing worth mentioning is, so I described to you a basic approach based on linear models and matrix regression. But we can easily extend this to the more general case when we have non-parametric kernel spaces for value function and Q function approximation. And in that case, the algorithm can be written in a kernelized way. And the regret analysis changes a little bit. And the regret will depend on the Hilbert space norm of the ground truth transition operator and a particular notion of effective dimension that also relates to the, the, uh, the underlying environment. Okay. So lastly, I hope I might have 10 more minutes. So uh, again, I hope that I could convince you that by doing regression properly with good feature representations, we can explore efficiently. But the next question, the final question I want to talk about is something more practical. So regression actually is not trivial, even if we know that theoretically it works. So this question is, how do we conduct regression efficiently in end-to-end -end training? So by that, I mean that what we were trying to do is, we try to start with one state action pair and predict something about the next state, right? So to make this work, in practice, our practical algorithms with uh, deep RL, with neural network approximation. <coughs> so we need to specify the regression target. So what do you mean by the regression target? So for example, something very simple is we can just do pixel to pixel training. We can try to predict all the pixels of the image of the next state. Yeah, we just do that, say we'll just use an RNN. Uh, alternatively, one may try to use some computer vision techniques to learn maybe 
boundaries and the key points of those images and try to use the key points as um, the next regression target. I should have a picture here. Imagine that there is a picture. Okay. So um, it turns out that there are limitations when we actually have to choose a regression, choose a target to do regression. So but for example, if we want to predict the next draw pixel image, in, a, in any computer game, we know that much of the many pixels are really about backgrounds or are, are not really meaningful for making the decisions. So much of the predictive quantities are not relevant for the actual game, but we still have to predict them to tune the learning agent. So there's a lot of computational overhead and generalizability could be bad because we are spending efforts trying to predict something that's not relevant. And also, because choosing the regression target depends on a particular problem. So one has to choose it, so I have to scale it and transform it, and this requires a lot of tuning. So one often has to do this in a case-by-case -case manner. Okay, so uh, I found a motivating example, which is new zero. So this is, I think, DeepMind's recent favorite paper on um, general AI. So mu0 is a simple model-based reinforcement learning algorithm. But it is nice in a way that it can generalize to 60 and more games, including old Atari games and uh, card games like Go, Shoggy, and Chess. So what mu0 does is the goal is they want to not use prior knowledge about the game or about the rules of the game. So Mildero has to learn from the scratch and learn the rule and use the learned rules to plan and adapt. Okay. So I think a few interesting quantities. So Mildero doesn't do any pixel to pixel prediction. It's it's a it's claims to be doing end to end training. <coughs> it's it's going to learn the rules of the game by estimating the transition model. And it's going to use the learned model to plan its core. And I think the, the very key idea that's, that's interesting is it only tries to predict quantities that are central to the game, meaning the strategies and the policies. It doesn't try to predict the raw next state. Okay. So can we understand this theoretically? So more generally, we can consider exploration in model-based RL in such a way. Let's say that we begin with just a general family of transition models. Okay. And uh, I want to, I we still want to do reinforcement learning and optimistic exploration. So when we have passed data, we always construct a particular regression loss function and then we construct a confidence set. And when we have a confidence set, we always use this confidence set of learned models to plan optimistically. So this is a general framework. So now the question is, do we need to construct the confidence set and regression to recover the full transition model? Do we need to predict every pixel? And uh, can we do model predict control without actually predicting the draw state? And can we only use value functions for self-training? And if we don't want to predict the round state and we want to use only value functions, how do we construct the loss functions? OK. So the short answer is yes. And um, the final algorithm is something that's pretty counterintuitive. OK. So we're going to do value targeted regression. So suppose that we had is a current value function. Let's say that the v hat can be queried using a, mon uh, a Monte Carlo tree search algorithm given an estimate model. So v hat is something we can compute and estimate. Okay. So whenever we observe a new transition sample, I'm going to construct a loss function in the regression. I'm going to predict the next value of state as a function of theta. Theta corresponds to one instance of transition model. And I'm going to use the current estimated value of the next state as the target. 
So V hat is not fixed. V hat is something that the algorithm computes and adapts. Okay. And then we use this particular value target regression to construct confidence set and then to use it to do optimistic planning. Okay. So basically the regression only uses one target, which is the estimated value of the next state. Okay, so this is counterintuitive because the algorithm is trying to learn something that has been produced by the algorithm itself, right? Yeah, so the short answer is we can prove that the regret of this algorithm is actually has a very elegant form. So it depends on a notion of eluder dimension of the general function class. And uh, again, in the special case of special linear case, this regret upper bounds matches the best we can do when we know the Poseidon regression target. But this result basically says that using the estimated value function is sufficient as a regression target if I simply want to learn to solve this RL task. Okay. Um, okay. So this talk is all about theory, so uh, but I just, we actually have a bunch of other like uh, less theoretical work, for example, like we try to understand how to learn like compressive state representations from unstructured state uh, trajectories. We try to use reinforcement learning to learn to optimize trivial pathways from batch data <coughs> and to predict new protein designs and also to use tensorization to learn representations. So I think the one good news is regression works for reinforcement learning. Thank you very much. <laughs>